That was the corporate viewpoint coming in, but we've also got two leading voices from the advisory world to get a better sense and try to scrutinize what the IRDA has done. I'm joined this week by Kusru Pantaki, partner at Walker Chandiyok & Co., and Vivek Gupta, partner at BMR Advisors. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking our time and joining me on the show. Vivek, let's kickstart uh, the discussion with you. Why do you think it was essential for the insurance regulator to clarify the concept of management control? Uh, so Ashwin, if we see the way the guidelines have come about on insurance, one would clearly see that socially, we've always tried to say that Indian control should be maintained. Uh, this, this has been a very uh, sensitive sector. Going up from 26% cap to 49% cap itself was a big step. And therefore, the government and the IRDA had been trying to explore ways to keep the control truly Indian. Uh, if you see the old guidelines, there was a declaration that was required to be filed by the Indian, uh, by the insurance company that it is actually Indian owned and controlled. So now we have uh, an objective exposition of what constitutes Indian control in addition to what constitutes Indian ownership. And if we see the way these guidelines have come about, uh, we had similar concepts already existing in other sectors. For example, media, uh, as far back as early 2000s, I think 2002 or something, came out with detailed guidelines on what constitutes Indian control. Uh, in 2009, you had Fresno 234 coming in, wherein the concept of Indian ownership and control in the context of holding companies came about. So I think the IRD has borrowed some of those concepts. Uh, in fact, it is, it is good that they have borrowed some of those con concepts because that uh, retains uh, consistency and objectivity uh, across regulations. And that is how this whole uh, objective definition of Indian ownership and control has been brought through these new guidelines. Khusru, you heard out Vivek. Uh, what are your viewpoints as far as uh, the need for clarity is concerned? Surely. Uh, if you look at the past, uh, you may recall that uh, foreign investors were allowed to hold up to 26%. However, at that point of time, uh, even the management control could be in the hands of the foreign insurers because the experience with the Indian insurers was not significant for them to control the company or to call the shots. Now, that had been happening in the past. So, although the Indian shareholders were holding 74% uh, and the foreign shareholders were holding 26%, uh, still the management control could be there, which eventually over a period of time, I have seen the companies transitioning the control from the foreign promoter to the Indian promoter. So, now there is absolutely no need, actually, if you look at it from a perspective of the fact that uh, control should be only in the hands of the foreign, uh, promoter, foreign promoters or foreign shareholders. It's now come to the Indian shareholders through this particular uh, announcement that the IRDA has made. And I think it makes a lot of sense because the market has become pretty mature. The market has become uh, very clear in terms of you know who calls the shots. And I think it's the right move uh, by the regulator to ensure that the control remains with the Indian promoters or the Indian shareholders. Kusru, also tell us what are some of the mandatory factors that Indian insurance companies will now have to keep in mind to ensure control. And also, do you foresee any compliance difficulties? So I don't foresee any kind of a compliance related uh, matter uh, currently because of the fact that uh, it's very, very clear. However, the Indian companies uh, will have to sort of, uh, Indian insurance companies will have to take a few steps to ensure that the control remains with the Indian promoter or is now with the Indian promoter. The first thing is the fact that uh, let's talk about three different scenarios. The first scenario is that a company which is uh, currently having 74% Indian promoter shareholding and 26% foreign promoter shareholding. That company now will have to, within three months, ensure that the control has to be there with the Indian promoters in case that the control still remains with the foreign promoter. The second could be a new insurance company coming into existence. Now, that could be the fact that now 49% can be with the foreign promoter and 51% can be with the Indian promoter. But from day one, it's very, very clear that the control has to be with the foreign promoter. And the third one also would be any other insurance company that is currently in existence where they may not even want to sort of increase the foreign shareholding from 26% to 49%. Despite the fact that it will be still remaining at 26%, the control will have to be now with the Indian promoter. So uh, I do not foresee this in terms of a major, major uh, constraint in terms of compliance. It's a matter of time. The Indian shareholder and the foreign shareholder will now have to sort of review and revise their agreements to make sure that these practices are now being followed. 
And I think even when it comes to a concern by the foreign promoter as to why these things are happening, it's very, very clear that these are happening on account of the new regulatory change and not on account of any other reason. Vivek, Khusru doesn't foresee any compliance difficulties. Do you concur? See, uh, so, so I will come to the objective factors in just a minute. What they have tried to do is the normal rights that a 51% shareholder should have. They have tried to put in the form of uh, mandatory requirements. If a joint venture is commercially negotiated as 5149, it is reasonable, for example, to assume that the 51% shareholder will have majority on the board of directors. So they have effectively put in a clause which says that the Indian party must nominate a majority of the uh, non-independent board members. Uh, it is also normal then to assume that the CEO will, will be a nominee of the Indian party. That is what they have again provided. Uh, interestingly, they have said that other KMPs, other key managerial personnel other than the CEO uh, can be, uh, need not be Indian party nominees so long as they are finally approved by the board. So what they have tried to do is they have tried to specify what are the rights that a 51% shareholder should ordinarily have and have legislated for those in the form of mandatory requirements. Uh, it is essential to do so because otherwise you could have a shareholders agreement which is 5149 in form but not 5149 in substance. In other words, the shareholders agreement could have given higher rights to a 49% shareholder as opposed to a 51% shareholder. So with these three, four mandatory requirements, they've tried to keep the 5149 relationship impact, the uh, relationship intact, and they've tried to make the shareholders agreement as honest as possible. Now let's try and understand how existing agreements will be impacted uh, because of these announcements uh, that have been made by the IRDAI. Do you think the existing agreements that have been signed between Indian parties and overseas investors will now have to be redrafted in a significant manner? That's very much right. Uh, the government has given time uh, of about three months to ensure that this is complied with. Personally, if you ask me, uh, three months is a very short period of time. However, they have also said that in the event that the companies are not in a position to comply with this, then they may ask for an extension of another three months, which is fine. I believe uh, that's a very rational approach to sort of you know ensure that the companies are complied. So the fact remains that, yes, uh, what they need to do, they need to ensure that uh, the agreements are uh, redrafted, the agreements are modified, because there will be a few agreements still where the control would be in the hands of the foreign insurer, and therefore that control needs to be passed through a clarity or through kind of a modification in the agreement. But also I feel very clearly that we have... Uh, liberalization in insurance and uh, in privatization in insurance uh, over the last 16 to 17 years now because this process started around 1999 and although initially the management control in case of many joint ventures was resting with the foreign promoters over a period of time that has come out very clearly so in many cases i'm sure that the agreements and all would have been redrafted but where it has not been there will be a need to do that and in a short period of time of three months Vivek, would you like to add to that? Well, so some bit of redrafting, yes. So these rights will now have to find their way into the JV contracts over a period of time, over the next three to six months. Uh, these must be uh, incorporated in the JV agreements. I frankly, practically do not see much difficulty in being able to incorporate these. Uh, in fact, uh, as opposed to uh, definitions of control that people had from, an, uh, from, a, uh, from a subjective perspective, introducing an element of objectivity helps both the Indian uh, shareholder as well as the foreign insurance company uh, to be able to legislate specifically. So yes, some redrafting involved, but I do not foresee that much difficulty or that much uh, trouble in being able to incorporate these provisions uh, in the shareholder agreements. Now let's examine another interesting aspect that finds its place in the new regs. Now the new regs say that both direct and indirect holding by foreign parties in an, Indi in, in an Indian insurance company shall not exceed 49%. How do you think that will change the dynamics on the ground, Vivek? No, so I don't think this changes much. Uh, I think that there is an old clarification in any case which said that in the context of HDFC and ICICI being uh, or, or entities like those being JV partners, their FII holding will not be counted. Uh, I would imagine that that clarification would continue. Uh, so practically on the ground, I don't think it changes much. Uh, of course, from a strategic angle, 
you can't now float a holding company where the strategic also has some stake and that stake will of course be counted proportionally uh, but that would have that would have been the case even before this definition of clarity came about uh, so i don't think this aspect really changes much i expect the old uh, hdfc icici kind of clarification to continue uh, and <clears throat> and therefore uh, the position should then uh, stay pretty much as is kusru do you expect any substantial changes on the ground because of uh, this provision now being explicitly clarified by the irdai if you recollect uh, a few years ago the regulators had expressed a concern in the case of a few insurance companies that the 26% shareholding by the foreign uh, shareholder or the foreign promoter could have been exceeded on account of the fact that there could be other institutions etc holding uh, of a certain percentage in the foreign shareholders equity which means that on an overall basis directly and indirectly the shareholding of the foreign promoter in the indian insurance company could have exceeded 26% that used to be the case earlier the regulator was very clearly and very very minutely examining every company and i believe that a compliance has been significantly ensured on that front so now when the stake increases from uh, 26% to 49% it's a significant increase by 23% for the foreign promoter to sort of ensure that uh, he has almost 49% shareholding or up to 49% shareholding and that also would lead to the fact that this particular shareholding would give them good amount of powers and a good amount of uh, a sort of you know faith and holding in the company to that extent my last question gentlemen and kusru you go first uh, what's really left here as part of the regulations as far as rights for foreign parties are concerned so actually if you look at uh, the rights and let's talk about you know a new insurance company coming in existence uh, i'm just taking two examples a company which is newly coming in existence so when we have a new company coming in existence uh, definitely the end promoter may not have enough expertise or adequate expertise so although he would be having the control maybe through agreements etc the foreign promoter may be able to provide some actual expertise or technology support and other operational support now the other right that the foreign promoter also would have would be in terms of appointment of some of the people who are not the real key managerial people in line with the agreements in line with the real regulations so they still have right to appoint some people they still have the right on the board by nominating a few seats they still have a right to sort of uh, advise and guide the company in terms of operation actual expertise and other things so yes there are quite a few rights i think the idea over here is that uh it's becoming almost a level playing field now where the foreign promoter has 49% the indian promoter has 51% our uh, government is also giving that opportunity to the foreign insurers that yes uh, when you start making profits you have 49% which is very very close to 51% you equally have the rights in the profits however they want to make sure that in order to sort of have a defined control and a defined assumption of responsibility the control and management uh control should be still in the hands of the indian promoter so yes there are quite a few areas where the foreign promoter would still be able to call the shots but overall the management control will be with the indian company vivek would you like to add to that no so barring what is specified everything else is left for parties to contractually decide so for example interestingly they've said that a appointment of all key managerial personnel other than the ceo uh need not be made by the indian party so long as it's approved by the board uh so effectively the way i read this is to say that the 51% indian shareholder can nominate the ceo on the venture the 49% uh foreign insurer uh can nominate the cfo on the venture and the cfo then of course has to be board approved but which is fine uh all key managerial personnel in any case under the companies act have to be board approved uh so i think there is barring the specifics there is significant contractual freedom in terms of what the foreign insurer can hold uh, apart from this right that i mentioned all the value protective rights what in legal parlance are not called the control rights but all the value protective rights in the form of affirmatives etc can also uh, be held by the foreign insurer so so i think this call this is a fairly balanced regulation allows the 51% shareholder to assert control yet at the same time gives a framework where the 49% foreign insurer can get uh, all the rights that he should ideally get as a 49% shareholder all right gentlemen on that note we have come to the end of this discussion thank you so much for taking out time and joining me on the show this week it's time now for a short commercial break but don't go anywhere 
Because coming up on the other side, we have two leading corporate voices speaking about the biggest issue in the telecom sector, the call drop menace. Sunil Bharti Mittal of Bharti Airtel and Himanshu Kapania of Idea Cellular. Catch them both on the other side and keep watching Amicus Curie.